Good evening um, to all the participants out there and to all the SAMA members and non-SAMA members. Once again, SAMA is hosting another one of its popular webinars. Tonight's webinar is an important topic, one which may be of more relevance to you than you realize, and one something many of you may have heard of, but are still a little unsure in terms of how it affects or will affect you. Our topic is on the protection of personal information or Poppy Act, and we will outline here tonight what provisions you need to adhere to before 1st of July, 2021. Before we get underway, I just would like to urge those of you who aren't yet members of SAMA to visit our website or contact us to find out more about the benefits of joining this important association. One of these benefits relates to our topic tonight. In addition to what our speaker will be saying tonight, all SAMA members will receive a free Poppy Act pack from SAMA, which I know will be of great benefit to you all. I'd like to ask all participants to please mute their microphones to avoid interference with the speakers. Please do not raise your hand or make use of the chat function as we are unable to respond to questions raised during the presentations. Important to notice that all questions can be asked after the presentation. Our moderator tonight would be Dr. William Oosthuizen, one of the two acting general managers and also the manager of SAMA's legal division. I am delighted to welcome tonight as our guest speaker, um, Mrs. Elsabie Klink, who is the managing director of Elsabie Klink and Associates, a Joburg-based law firm specializing in health law, health policy, and health ethics. Apart from her law degree, Elsabie also has a degree in applied psychology. I think she needs this to deal with all this in, in this medical field. Elsabie is not new to SAMA. She worked here previously as a legal advisor, and she has, in fact, been working in the legal health sector since 2001, it's 20 years later. She also worked at the Foundation for Professional Development as Director of Compliance and Consulting in the pharmaceutical sector at the Trade Association and at a prominent healthcare consultancy. Prior to her healthcare um, involvement, Alsabi was also a senior lecturer in the Department of Constitutional Law at the Free University of the Free State, where she worked for eight years. In her practice, Alsabi serves clients in um, the pharmaceutical, medical devices, health care professionals, and health facility markets. Her team at EK, standing for Elsabee Klink and Associates, includes five other professionals, some with dual legal and healthcare qualifications, serving the sector not only in Gauteng, but also in Cape Town and the Free State and in most of, South Af and in most of the South African languages. Um, I'm, I'm, and I'm great, great the, uh, or grateful to Elsa before for being such um, uh, forward thinking. So Elsa B has published several articles and has spoken at many forums on topics relating to constitutional law, human rights, health law, ethics, and social security. <clears throat> she is a co-author of several books, including on employment equity law and international human rights standards. She has also published chapters in social security law. In addition, LCB has undertaken research for several organizations, including the Taylor Committee of Inquiry into Social Security and the South African Business Coalition on HIV and AIDS. It's a mouthful, LCB. It is a great honor for me to welcome Elsie B as our guest speaker tonight. And I would now hand over to her for her insights. And as I've mentioned, after her talk, 
I will invite Dr. Oosthuizen to take her reins and guide us through the question and answer session. Elsie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's like the great coming home, you know, to be back. It feels, I was thinking this evening, um, one of the things that we used to do when I worked at, at Sama with Carlene and everybody is we, um, you know, if there was a little milk in the bottle left, you used to shake it. So we kind of made our own cappuccinos in a very rudimentary way. So it's funny how certain things stick with you 20 years later. So let's go to the slides. <clears throat> So this, I think, is, is important, is that we, we all talk about poppy, and I hear some people talk about papaya, and I think the papaya is going to strike the fan on the 30th of June, um, where they combine the poppy act and the Paya act. Now, poppy is relevant because it has to do with personal information. Okay, so although it's two laws. One is about personal information. The Access to Information Act is about all information, not only personal information. So it's really important that if you become the information officer of a practice, and you will by default be that if you're the practice owner or the managing director or the managing partner in a practice, um, you are responsible for both these laws, but the, the one is slightly broader. The PIA is a lot broader. And PIA actually came into effect when I worked at SAMA 20 years ago. And that's when we did our first PIA manual. So um, it's, it's, it's not a new thing. The poppy, on the other hand, is a new thing. Um, and, and one of the things that's really new, I did this morning quite early, um, is to register myself for our businesses um, uh, at the information regulator as the, as the information officer. So this is then Popaya, and Popaya then is governed by the information regulator. So the information regulator has therefore the power to oversee the implementation of both these laws. Um, and it's for that reason also that why I um, recommend, many people have said, you know, do your bio manual and submit it to the Human Rights Commission. You'd have to resubmit it in any event to the information regulator. So I'm saying, you know, hang tight a bit um, with your information manual, with your PIA manual, um, because um, they're, they're in any case doing new regs on it. So yeah, I'll talk to you about that a bit. But that is their website. So, and in the poppy pack that we did for Sama, um, there are the links. So I checked the links again about a week ago, but they changed the information. So don't, if, if the link tomorrow <laughs> isn't the same, um, don't blame us, the stuff moves around. So um, just always check um, and, and you can always ask, you know, is this the latest information? Is this the correct information? But going onto their site, a lot of the information you'll find there under documents. Um, so one can click there and, and then you'll see all the various documents come up that they have so far issued. So then um, just to that we all know what all the basics are. Um, so Poppy Act or Popaya refers to the Protection of Personal Information Act. In other countries, and if you deal with people that want to make you, so people who has headquarters in Europe, for example, they will talk about DPA, Data Protection Act, or DP, Data Protection. In South Africa, we talk about PI, personal information. So we use different terminology, and it is important that we custom make for South Africa because that's what the information regulator will look at. They'll say, have you followed South African law? Then I have now um, abbreviated the information regulator as IR, an information officer as IO, and a deputy information officer as a DIO. So um, many practices have ha has the most amazing practice management people. 
And it would be worth your while to make your practice manager your deputy information officer. Let them run with it. You can mandate them to do anything. You remain liable, but you know they can deal with the run of the mill poppy implementation issues. <coughs> Apologies. And then PIA is the Promotion of Access to Information Act. And then there's two important concepts. The one is an operator. And I kept on thinking, you know, I'm a typical 80s teenager. I think there was a song, Smooth Operator or Smooth, yeah. So that just makes me think of that. Now, an operator is somebody who you outsource a duty to. Okay. So normally, a business could do their own payroll, or you can outsource it to somebody. That outsourcing entity is an operator. Okay. This is different to if you, for example, get a vendor to give you legal advice on labor law issues. Okay. That is not, that person's not an operator. They're not fulfilling your function. They're from the outside giving you advice on your business, for example. So just make sure that you understand the difference when somebody is an operator. So they actually, a good example of operators are third party intermediaries that submit accounts and manage it for you at RAF or the compensation fund. So those entities are entities that are operators. In Europe, they're called data processors. And that's where it gets confusing because in South Africa, we say a practice would be processing information. Then there's a responsible party, and that would be you, the practice. So the practice as a legal entity, or if you're a solace practice, you in that capacity will be responsible and will are called the responsible party. In the EU, they call data controllers. So again, um, the terminology isn't exactly the same. But just be aware of that. If somebody wants you to sign... Uh, a consent. So, you know, a pharmaceutical or a device company says, you know, our reps support you in theater with the equipment or what, 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 and we are the data controllers. Then you'll know that means that company is the responsible party for that data um, that they get from you to for it, where you consent towards them and so on. So, so the Poppy Act's got a wide implication, not only on you, but also on others um, in, in your field. So then um, just remember the existing health laws on in particular, the protection and disclosure of health information is still in place, okay. So Poppy make it possible to verbally consent to disclosures, but the National Health Act does not make that possible. The National Health Act says the consent must be in writing. And that is why one of the documents in the pack is a consent to disclosure. So that makes you safe as the practitioner, because then you can say, here is the patient's written consent that I could speak to the HR manager in their division as to why they had long COVID, for example. So that consent is then a written consent. And then the Poppy Act recognized the second reason for disclosure is if a law authorizes it. The only dynamic that the Poppy Act puts on top of this is we must tell people that we are sharing information in accordance with a law. So that's different. And this is why, for example, with your staff, the fact that you collect the bank details and you submit stuff to SARS, yes, the law requires that. But you need to now say to them, listen, um, we have to provide payroll information to the receiver of revenue. If you're in a larger practice and you have to um, for, um, complete these employment equity forms of the racial composition and gender in your workplace, um, you have to do that under the Employment Equity Act. So there is a law that authorizes disclosure, but the law um, needs to now be declared. So um, I'll show you now two laws that relate to disclosure specifically in the health sector. And then obviously if there's a court order, and then this is also important, it actually says healthcare professionals. So 
I see tonight on the call, um, I hear we've, we've got occupational therapists and so on. So if a GP refers to an OT, for example, um, they, it says there's no specific consent necessary to talk to the other person. So the OT can talk to the GP and the GP to the OT, but it must be in the patient's interests and necessary for that patient's healthcare. So what we've had a query earlier this evening is um, that patients are now asking for a copy of these referrals. So if the referral is done by a referral letter or referral note, the patients are asking for a copy of that. And under PIA, they're entitled to it. So um, some of the practices use that consent to disclosure also so that the, if it is a really comprehensive report that the patient understands, the other healthcare professional will get that full comprehensive report now. So here's two of, of um, the provisions that actually authorize disclosures in law. So the one is if there is a managed care agreement between a doctor and a medical scheme, then you are authorized or you're authorizing, the law authorized the scheme to access all that patient's information. So, um, and, but it is important if you are in managed care agreements, that you actually disclose that um, and that the patients know. Um, this section does not authorize these forensic investigations that says the scheme's entitled to all the patient's information. It's only if there is a managed care agreement. And then the second one, our old friend, the ICD-10 codes on an account to a medical scheme, it is mandatory. But what you have to do is you have to say to patients, the ICD-10 code will appear on the account. And then you have to say to people, if you don't want that account to go to the medical scheme and perhaps that your wife who's the principal member sees that, um, you know, you have to pay cash. We're not going to submit to the scheme um, because if I do submit, there must be an ICD-10 code and I can't commit fraud. I can't give a wrong ICD-10 code. So that's an example where there is a disclosure of health information that's authorized by a law. So just to remind you of what personal information are. So it's that whole list that you see there, race, gender, age, and it doesn't need to all be accompanied with your name. So your ID number is an identifier. So if it is possible, you may even identify me by my street address or um, by, um, you know, some kind of membership list or whatever the case may be, a medical scheme number. So <coughs> if there are any of these things, so if you deal with this, so you'll see part of your poppy, your mandatory poppy analysis is to check what of this list do we have and where do we have it? So do I have it on a distribution list to patients? Do I have it on a, um, a contacts list because I'm part of a journal club? Do I have it um, in which setting, which database we're talking about? What of this information do I have? So, and then there's two types of special information, health information and children's information. And with that, I'll show you, you actually need to take extra precautions because um, the disclosure thereof is could do people harm or it could lead to discrimination against a person on their health status. Then just processing, people often think processing means I'm working with something. Processing also means having something or giving something. So if you give a telephone number or if you receive a telephone number, you need to actually get the permission of the person. Somebody this afternoon said they have the cell phone number of one of these really prominent figures now in the vaccine, COVID vaccine issues. Um, and she had to, the person was very offended because she didn't want to share it with him because they're in the same workplace, but she did the right thing. And she first asked the prof, can I share your details with our medical director 
in this company. And that's the right way to do it. So it's not only reworking information that's processing, it's possessing it, having it, um, you know, and it doesn't matter how it comes into your possession. If it is in your possession, you're a responsible party. So you're actually responsible for that information. And then here is the health um, and biometric information that's really special information. Um, and it says people like our business cannot have health information whatsoever. Okay. So um, if you want to send us, if you're a forensic inquiry and you want to send us the patient details, we're not supposed to have it unless we can fulfill these conditions. So the patient has signed a consent and said, it's okay that these other advisors that's helping you in this thing with a medical scheme is doing it. Or we get this often. We do a heap of counsel for medical schemes cases. Um, we now have about um, eight upcoming in the beginning of June. So with that, we, we have to have the patient's information because we're helping the patient enforce their rights towards a medical scheme. And in that, then we make the patient sign a consent that we can have that information. So we have special things that's placed on us. Medical practitioners and other healthcare providers don't have to have that. So you automatically have access to personal information and health information because of your profession. So you don't need to every time get a consent from the patient to say, yeah, you can have my information. That's not necessary. But it does say there must be a contractual duty of confidentiality. And this is why your T's and C's in your practice is so important because the T's and C's become the contract between the practitioner and the patient. And that must say, we make sure that we treat your confidential information confidentially in line with the Poppy Act. Um, so, and that's also where you can say that under certain circumstances, I must disclose like the ICD-10 code, or if it is a, a workman's compensation issue, I have to disclose certain reports and blah, blah, blah. So just always bear in mind, there's a difference between our business, we're not healthcare providers and your business, um, and, but that you, you, are, you have to have a contractual obligation. So the ethical obligation to confidentiality is no longer enough. So this is just a reminder of the conditions of processing. So uh, my colleague, Pat Matseke, that some of you have worked with, um, she's, she's our poppy queen, actually. She knows everything about poppy and the GDPR and so on. Um, so she talks about the seven cardinal rules. Um, and the first one is accountability. It says, if you've got personal information, you're accountable. The second one is processing limitation. So that means, I can only work with or receive information if I have a right to have that information. So somebody's consented or there's a law that authorizes it, or it is my existing patient and I can communicate with them. But always remember they've got an opt out if it's voluntary. So, you know, it's not like a legislative duty. Um, and then I have to process in a manner that is adequate, relevant, and not excessive. So it is my big back bear, these file covers that you buy from stationery shops, and it still have marital status on. It is not necessary for the patient's health care. If you think it's necessary for the health care, you can ask in a consult, what is your living arrangements? So we should not be collecting information that is superfluous. We must only so really tight, just what we need, we collect. So critically reflect on what is on that front file, um, that front page of those files that you, that you have. Um, and then obviously with that, you only keep information for as long as you need it, or for if there's a law that prescribes it. Um, then purpose specification, people must know why you are processing the information and you need to stick within that. You can't further process. So we often have cases where people say, but I've got this amazing patient cohort and these files, and I can just go through the file and do a kind of a retrospective study and write it up. And if you want to do that, you need to get a new consent, unless you got the consent initially from the patients to say, we do regular reviews of patient files and use it for research purposes. But I don't think you're going to get permission 
um, in any event for that. But just remember further processing you need consent for again. If <coughs> the consent wasn't initially um, obtained, you're responsible for the quality of the information. So reception staff ask every time of the patient, is this still your information? Is this still correct? Openness we've spoken about, telling people that because this is a complaint, uh, a claim at the compensation fund, there must be medical reports regularly filed. We have no choice. So um, tell people if you have to do something in terms of the law, tell people about ICD-10 codes on accounts to medical schemes. And then the security safeguards is also really important. And we'll get into that in a bit of detail. Okay, so that's actually just the overview. So let's get into the nitty gritty of what you have to do and how this SOMA poppy pack will help you do it. So um, this is the nice thing, this fancy stuff, the artwork on the left hand of the slide is not me. <laughs> That's the SOMA people that have done that quite nicely. Um, and Angelique assigned the covering letter and the covering letter you'll see um, our business is offering also a deal where we um, will help people if you've got additional needs in terms of poppy compliance, our staff can help and will help at a discounted rate. Um, we, we will just need your SOMA membership number so that, we can, so that we know who are SOMA members and who benefit from this or not. Um, and then there's six key documents. Um, there's a guideline on the Poppy Act. So what we must do, and this is what I'll take you through now. There's a Poppy policy or framework document. This is the document that if the information regulator inspectors come to the practice, so it will be a bit like the labor law inspectors, they come and they check whether you comply. And I think healthcare practices is a soft target because if people feel aggrieved, it's very nice to just someone complain everywhere. So, and I think it will become part of people's repertoire. So that's the document where you say, this is our poppy policy. This is how we deal with personal information in this practice. Then your PIA manual and guide, and that's also an easy thing to do, I think. Um, then there's um, three documents. The consent to disclosure is fairly easy, I think. The reporting form on disclosure is important because that poppy inspector that comes and looks for your poppy framework or your poppy policy would also want to know, do you have a record of to whom you have disclosed personal information? And that form that's labeled six here would help for that. And then number seven is a magnus opus because it has many pages and a lot of you will run for the hills when you see it, but it is complete. It has every single potential requirement on how long you must keep a piece of information, whether it's personal information or whether it's your in while well, your invoices all would also have personal information on. Whatever the type of info, what does the VAT Act say? What does the Companies Act say? What does the Occupational Health and Safety Act say? Every single thing is listed there. And that's why the document looks long. It's practical in the beginning and I'll show you what is practical that will show you that will help you with archiving retention and destruction of documents because under the Poppy Act if you destroy personal information and somebody actually needs it or wants it you need to have proof that you destroyed it in a rational way and you weren't careless about it. So um, this is this is our full suite of documents. So people have asked if they if they're not SOMA members, where can they get it? Um, we have this, um, and we, we've got some of the types of documents we've combined together in kind of packs that you then, if you buy the whole pack, you get a discount and all of that. Um, but if you're SOMA members, um, if you're medical doctors and you can be SOMA members, you sort it. Um, SOMA has looked well after you. So, the SAMA Poppy Guideline, <clears throat> the first thing that you have to do and that all of you would have to do between now and the 30th of June is you have to register yourself or the other person who's the head of the practice 
as the practices information officer. I did mine, there you see on the right hand side, that's my certificate. So you get an official certificate from them. It gets emailed like an immediately, okay? So you go in here on the left hand side through that portal. They want to know your address, your cell phone number, your email address, your ID number. Um, I was just pleading with them. I don't want my cell and my ID number to be out there. Um, they want your gender. Um, and then, you know, if you're a small business like us, you'll, you won't have gazillion addresses because you may practice from one or two places. So they want all of that. And then they issue you with this official document that you will, that will be the first thing in your copy file. That if an inspector ever comes in, you say, we've got, first thing has been ticked. Um, and you'll see it tells you, it gives the, um, the registration number and it will say, it says Elsie Clunk is the information officer for Elsie Clunk and Associates. And I have to be that by definition. I can't give that to Pat because I am the managing director of the business. So this is not a choice thing. Under PIA in the old days, it was a choice. You can pick somebody to be the information officer. Now it says it is the person who is, so it will be the CEO of a company who is, or the managing director. Um, so in solace practices, it's easy. If you are in a partnership, you need to decide who's the managing partner and that person is the person that will complete this. It also provides for your deputies. So if you are going to appoint your practice manager as your deputy information officer, have their details ready so that you can go through the process. So it's online and you have to, you, you can't go back, you know, so have the stuff all ready um, so that you can complete it. You can escape, but then you need to start again. Um, so if you're now the information officer, like I am, I have these five duties. I'm responsible to develop a poppy compliance framework. I'm responsible to do an impact assessment. Now, this second thing also means keep a record somewhere. If you go through these steps that we show that you've done it and when you've done it. Um, so, you know, you've done a risk analysis, you check the security, you check the file cabinets, can they lock, can't they lock, blah, blah, blah. Um, then the third thing is you're responsible for the PIA manual. Fourthly, you're responsible to make sure there's adequate measures in place. And lastly, you're responsible to make sure the staff and everybody is aware of their duties under the Poppy Act. So that is also important. Um, and tonight's um, event, for example, if you have staff who is also, this will be an awareness raising for them as well. So you can use these events, just document it and say awareness raising this is what I've done. I can already see your poppy file with its dividers. If you are still a hard copy person that says, here's our compliance framework, here's our impact assessment. And right at the front, here's my certificate and so on. And at the end, here's the training that we've done. Here's the awareness raising that we've done with staff. So um, this, the information regulator is the main contact with the IR. Oh, the IO is the main contact with the IR. So the officer like me, if the information regulator gets a complaint or a query, it will come to me. So I am the representative of the responsible party. So um, it's, it's, a, it's an important job. And that's also why with some of my multinational clients, um, they say, but you know, we've got a global privacy office. But the South African regulator wants somebody here who they could hold to account and who they could contact in terms of poppy complaints. So the second thing, so information officer is the first thing. The second thing is PIA compliance. So if you have many of you may still have the old PIA manuals that we did in my summer days and after that, um, it doesn't look exactly the same. The first bit looks the same. The second bit kind of brings Poppy in. So you just need to revamp it if you've got one. If you don't have one, you can use the, the um, SOMA template thing to, to do that. So it's really important that you understand 
as the information officer, how does PIA work? So PIA works on somebody requesting information. So it's a really nice tool to use. You know, if you get a request from an attorney or somebody, because they must disclose why they want the information. So the attorney says, I want all the records of Mrs. Zulu. And then you say, mm, but why? Because they must say why they want that. And that gives you an opportunity to say, must I talk to MPS? Must I do this? Must, you know, is there a risk and so on? Um, you've got 30 days to respond and provide the information. If you can do it earlier, you can. Um, if they want hard copies, you can actually charge fees and so on. You'll see the manual has got the request the form at the end and then the fees. Just note that those forms are currently up for amendment. So we will probably then through SOMA, if it changes, give you an updated version so that you can just replace the request a form with a new one and the fees with a new one. Because I think those fees are still kind of 10 cents for a photocopied page. And it doesn't talk about USBs and so on. It still talks about floppy disks and things. <laughs> so, I mean, it's really old. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it will be updated, but don't worry about that. And then just remember, you must refuse information if the husband wants the wife's information, unless the wife consents, and then they use that consent to disclosure template. Unless the wife consents, the husband cannot get the wife's information. He can just get his own information, but he must still say why he wants it. So it's really, really important to understand that. And that is, in my view, a good risk management strategy is to know why are people requesting information. So <clears throat> the biggest work under the Poppy Act is this impact assessment because that will, whatever you find in your impact assessment will influence how your poppy policy or your poppy framework looks in the end. So there you have to do three things. You have to say, what are we, what do we have? Um, so on employees, do we have a husband's details, ID numbers, da, 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 da. So what do we have? Of suppliers, what do we have? Of our staff, what do we have? And then you need to see, am I getting it just right? And I talk about this, I call this the Goldilocks question. So the just right porridge is what you're looking for. So don't get too little, don't get too much, get what you need. So from an employee, you don't need to have all the children's contact details and the nephew and the this and the that. You just need the stuff that you need to process payroll, to follow up if something's wrong with a person, whatever. So, so make sure that you adhere to the Goldilocks rule and then discard the stuff that you have that is excessive, that you don't need. And then check, if I have this information, is this information compliant with the conditions of processing? That's seven cardinal rules of PAT. We have phrased them in the poppy guide for you into specific questions. I know this is a bit horrible. It didn't cut and paste nicely, but in the poppy guide, you'll see it nicely. It basically, what those questions say is if I have this information, why do I have it? Do I have a consent to have it or a law? The Poppy Act says if you're a healthcare professional, you don't need consent. The, the act, which is a law, says you can have it. All right. For me, I need to say, mm. the other day I had to say to my staff, you know what? I see patient records in our system. Do we actually have authority to have that specific information? If not, we delete. So, um, and then if we share that information, on what authority are we sharing? Do we have a patient consent again? Do we have a law? What allows us to share? And then um, what is in that information? That's the Goldilocks thing. Is there stuff that we shouldn't be having? Should we say to people, don't fill in marital status? It's not relevant. Um, many people also, we're so used to medical schemes that we automatically ask the main members details. 
we're not even sure if this will go to the main member or the person wants the main member, but we just routinely ask stuff. So be very careful where you ask information routinely. And then the purpose specification, what will you do with the information? And may we, if we want to do something with it later on, do we have permission to do that other thing with it later on? So if, for example, prescription data is put in a big pot and that pot sells the prescription data, it means the patient's prescription data is not just there to generate a prescription to get medicine from the pharmacy. It's actually also used for a database that checks who has prescribed what. And in some cases, that database is commercialized. It's sold um, back to the pharmaceutical or devices industry or whatever. So um, make sure that you cover those scenarios. Then the information, how long will we have it, where we have it, and who's responsible. So that's practically. It's in that folder. The receptionist is responsible. It's in that file. The receptionist is responsible for it. And then after seven years, because it's a patient record, we'll destroy, for example. Or after two years, we archive. And after seven years, we destroy. So <coughs> be very clear as to... So, so this actually is a bit of, of documenting what do we have and, and that may be a collective exercise in a practice where more than one person, um, how many you are, sit together and think about what do we have. You may have a contacts database. You may have, you have an appointment book worth personal information. And it can be in hard copy or it can be in soft copy. So, so think about all the places where you have personal information and can you measure it against these criteria? Then the security stuff is really important. The information regulator is pedantic about this because of all the leaks that we've seen, um, the hacking. I don't know if you saw very recently now um, the WhatsApp hacks where um, people have hacked into WhatsApp accounts to access um, information um, that is sensitive. Um, so that's really, they are really, really pedantic about this. So um, if you do have a data breach, so there is a hack or information is stolen, this we've had a number of times where people have said they have a forensic inquiry by medical scheme and they said, but we had a break in and a whole bunch of files were, were, were stolen or we've had a flood and the files were destroyed. So what this section wants you to think is what could happen to the data? What could happen to the personal information? And what must I do to prevent that? To prevent loss? So, you know, somebody goes to the printer and they accidentally take somebody else's document that was printed out and then everybody's looking for this document and documents not missing. So are there measures that we can put in place to make sure that doesn't help, does, doesn't happen? Damage, and damage includes physical damage like floods and so on, but also um, files being corrupted um, on a computer and so on. So do you have backups? That would be your security measure. Uh, how frequently are the backups done? Where are they, are they stored offsite? Um, we once did a project when I worked at a consulting entity um, where we looked at um, backups at a, a government entity and um, the backups were actually stored on top of the server in that entity. Now that doesn't help because if you have a fire or a flood, that server and all the backups are gone. So <coughs> think about that. Unauthorized destruction, so something that gets shredded that shouldn't be shredded, um, and then unlawful access. And that's where the hacking and all of that comes in. So we recently had to give assurance, we use Dropbox Professional um, as our storage system. And we had to give assurance to some of our clients that the security measures that Dropbox has in place is adequate. So they were able, Pat helped us in, in just assessing the types of security measures that they have. So be careful in terms of what you use as online storage systems and so on, and that they can prove that they are in line with, with industry standards and so on. So then the first step, is you have to actually check um, what policies and contracts do you have? Do you need poppy clauses in them? Um, 
uh, today we also had um, a query from a practice that said, you know, we are sending SMSs to patients to confirm appointments. Can we still do it? And yes, you can do it if you say to the person, do you want to receive this? Because this is voluntary. This is not mandatory that they must receive them and give them the opportunity to opt out. But also the best thing is if they sign their first, the patient form that they sign when they first come to the practice, let them say, yes, I agree to receive SMSs or no, I don't want it. And then let them give a number. Why, or that they that also make sure that they say you say that's the number that the individual's given us it's not we didn't pick a number you know amongst the, all the numbers on the form so and that people are then also clear if they don't opt in for that particular communication that they will not get reminders and if they don't get reminders and they don't pitch there could be repercussions for not pitching for your uh, appointment um Checking your contracts, your employment contracts, um, because now you need to disclose to employees our employment contracts. We've recently redone our templates that it's got the poppy clauses in, um, because you must say to people, we will have your bank account details, we'll have your addresses, we'll have your um, partner or spouse's details and so on. And the same with vendors or suppliers or reps, you know, those companies, you actually have information from people, you know, you've got a repair person or you've got an account, um, people that does your switching of your medical scheme accounts, you know, and they come into the practice and they have access to personal information. And that's why you actually need an operator agreement with them. So to make sure that those staff are also bound by all the poppy things and you'll have vendor clauses. So there's operator agreements and vendor clauses that you may have to just cover poppy aspects of what their duties is. Because that means then if they violate the duties, you can say, hang on, we told them that these are the duties and that they should not be violating it. Otherwise, you as the responsible party, people will say, oh, but the leak came from your practice. What did you do about it? And you can say it's in the contract. Um, so what you'll then do is on all of this information, you'll draft your poppy policy and framework, and that will be one of the key policies. Um, and then you can check, do I need other policies? Um, what we have developed recently for practitioners, and I actually think we, we've never put it on our online shop, um, is for example, the use of social media. Um, and what is the practices policy in terms of social media ver internally and also with patients? And um, what's your IT policy? You know, to what extent can your staff use a printer for their children's schoolwork or, you know, whatever. So um, all of that, because now the child's test is copied and it gets left accidentally in the printer and that's personal information. So or in the copying machine. So, so just think about, do we need other policies perhaps apart from the overarching policy framework. If you do a lot of clinical trials and clinical research, you may need to have a particular policy as to how you deal with the research entity, the, the, the CRO, um, the clinical research organization, and the CRA, the clinical research associate, who is in the practice, who's part of the trial, blah, blah, blah. So you may have to identify specifics for your practice that you need to deal with it. Um, OTs, for example, deal a lot often with, with schools and teachers and so on. Do we perhaps need a policy to say, what is the relationship between the practice, the patients or the parents and the school? Um, so, so think about what you may need to cover yourself in, in terms of that. If you're a physio and you're in a rehab unit and you work together with a whole lot of other people, um, you know, are they, do we need specifics on how all of us deal with the records of a patient that is in a rehab unit? Um, this is um, the 10 rights that people have in terms of personal information. So this notification of rights we recommend put it in employment agreements, put it in vendor agreements so that everybody knows if they deal with personal information, firstly, the person whose information it is must be notified of it. 
and either they must be notified that it's it's voluntary or it's mandatory. You don't have a choice. We have to submit this to the Employment Equity Commission, for example, or we have to submit this to SARS. But they need to be notified and they need to know why you're doing it and so on. So a bit of explanation. Um, a lot in the Poppy Act is a bit like over explaining why you do stuff. So, but the, the more you explain, the less likely you'll be in trouble. Um, be notified if there's a data breach, so unlawful access, do your PIA stuff, a, a person is entitled to make a PIA request, um, people can, and number four and five go together, they can correct, delete or distract, or they can object to processing of personal information, but of course the patient cannot say, but doctor, I didn't like that you said there, um, you know, she was depressed that morning, it's the doctor's notes that he has to make that or she must make that observation. So that can't be deleted. But if somebody says, I've changed my name, I'm no longer LCB, I'm now Ella, then so be it. We need to respect that. So um, that correction and so on is, is possible. Um, then people can withdraw consent. And you'll see a lot of the newer consent forms con contain that. So a patient say, I'm OK with the support that the diabetic nurse educator is rendering, but the patient is informed that they've got the right to withdraw that consent. Um, and then number seven is really important. If you run a database and you send bulk mailers or bulk SMSs to your patients, um, you can always do it if they are your patients. So they've gotten services or goods, people can communicate with you once, but then you need to give them the opportunity to opt out. Okay, so that's really important. So if you get unsolicited emails from the 1st of July, from somebody who you've never had any relationship with ever, okay, you've got grounds to lay a complaint against them, and that's number nine at the information regulator. So number eight is just automated decision-making, where, for example, we stratify the patients and say, you know what? Oh, all, of, all the people over 60 are, you know, we, we don't bother about them and, you know, we don't give them certain information. That would be automated processing. And then we are making decisions that adversely affect them. And then lastly, one has the right to approach the courts. But number nine is important. The information regulator. So in our household, there's been already two complaints at the information regulator and they were both taken up. We were quite surprised. So, um, it, it is an, a fairly easy way. I think the volumes will pick up after July, the 1st of July, but yeah. So all that's left in that poppy pack that we now haven't discussed is the consent to disclosure, the reporting form, and then the archiving retention document. So the consent to disclosure is an important thing for a practice. We developed it a long time ago before poppy was a huge thing. Um, but it is, for example, something that you can get the patient complete so that you know exactly who you can disclose things to. Because sometimes people say, yeah, you can disclose, but what exactly can I disclose and to whom and for how long is this disclosure valid? So those, that's in the template that we've developed so that you don't forget and that the person is really specific. Because afterwards people say, yeah, but I didn't mean you could disclose that. I meant this. Now this form makes you safe because the person must say, is it this or that, or what exactly is it that you want disclosed? Um, and if people do that, keep copy in the patient file or in the employee file, and then um, keep a copy because um, in, in a giver, so there's a copy in the practice in the patient file and the copy that goes to the patient so that the patient can also be reminded as to what they have agreed to. Then the report on disclosures, and that's what the information regulator will look for when they inspect. So <clears throat> you, you don't do that with run of the mill stuff. So, you know, you won't do that with every patient where there's an ICD-10 code on an account. That's ridiculous. Or, you know, the SARS information or UIF information. But for example, if there was a medical scheme forensic investigation and you got 10 patients consents and you disclosed 10 patients files, this form you then use because this is now an extraordinary thing that you've disclosed personal information in a setting that that isn't normal like an icd-10 code on on an account 
So if you then have an inspection, you can say, yes, we've had a forensic inquiry by a medical scheme. They wanted 10 patients' files. We disclosed eight because we had consent from eight patients. So that makes it easy. And that will also come in your big poppy file with its dividers. Then the retention document, that's the document that tells you every document that you have to store for how long. We've also put in there, if, if there is no prescription, and then the Poppy Act says you store the information for as long as you need it. So you then need to decide when don't I need it, and then you can put that in your Poppy policy. So whatever isn't in a law, you can say in a Poppy policy, this will destroy at that time. Um, we've got three templates there that you can use to record in your Poppy file when documents are being archived. So if anybody is looking for something, it's, oh, but it's been archived. Or, oh, it's been destroyed. Or you can say, um, we've, this is what we've retained, this is what we've archived, and this is what we've destroyed. So a nice table format thing. That will, that will show you. Um, under the Access to Information Act, it is a defense to say that a document's been destroyed. But people will ask you, where's your proof that you've destroyed? How do I know you're not just hiding it somewhere? So, and then that record will be a good thing. And then um, the person who's destroyed it will, will say, I have destroyed it. So, um, there's other templates that I've spoken about. The operator agreement is also a, um, it's a it's a it's a complex long document. I would suggest that if you have an operator, so a payroll administrator or um, an accounting firm that where you outsource your accounting to, let them give you an operator agreement. So let them do the work and and you can sign it and and if you want to, we can check it for you. But um, you know, all with security companies. Um, or CCTV companies. That was our very first operator agreement that we drafted was for a, um, a large practice where they had to install CCTV in common areas because of incidents that they've had in the practice. Um, <coughs> and then at a stage, they became aware that because they had these young men and women who were really attractive that the security companies were kind of, the guys were drooling over this footage. <laughs> so um, we then had to sign an agreement, an operator agreement, because they're actually handling security on behalf of the practice. So um, another example would be brokers, if they manage um, medical scheme stuff on behalf of the practice for staff, they would also be an operator. So we have then covered all the documents that's in your SAMA pack um, and a bit more detail on what your steps, your five steps to become poppy compliant. So that's the end of my story then. Thank you very much for listening to me. No, thanks so much for that LCB. I think it was an excellent presentation. And I, I really do hope that the, the SOMA members and the other doctors on the chat um, take up this opportunity to, to download that Poppy Pack, which will we, we will be sending out um, tomorrow. We'll be sending out a link there too. Um, we, we really do think that it will be very helpful to, to our members and practitioners to, to guide them along this compliance journey. And as always, um, from Salma's side, we're there to, to assist you. And I know that Alcibi, we've negotiated a special rate for those of you that require additional assistance. Um, so, so please, we are here to help you. We're here to support. Um, Alcibi, I don't know whether you can see the, the Q&A section. I've tried to answer some of the questions, um, but I, I think it speaks to the uncertainty of, around this legislation and, and the newness thereof. Uh, the fact that we've got so many questions. Um, so there are quite a few very important questions in here. And I'd just like to say due to co time constraints, we, we may not get to all of the questions, but we'll put together a FAQ for the general questions. And where there are more specific questions, we'll try and reach out and answer those. And, and if any of you on the, the chat or, or in the participants tab, 
have any other questions or clarity you seek, more than welcome to reach out to Salma or we could also refer you to, to Alcibi. Um, Alcibi, I don't know if there's a question that had perhaps caught your eye that you'd like to perhaps address first. I haven't looked at any of them. So, you know, if you present, the, oh, I can't see dear. the questions. Let me, so that's let why me, you are there. <laughs> let, me give you a, let me give you a couple. You can pick. Um, so there was a, <laughs> perfect. So there was a question about if you are a, practicing as a sole practitioner, are you by default the only information officer? Um, yes. Do you fall with the need for a deputy information officer? So that's yeah, a question so, yeah. um, some of the practitioners might actually yeah. have. And that's easy. You are the information officer and you don't need a deputy. Okay. So even if you're a large practice, if you don't want a deputy, nobody is forcing you to have a deputy. You'll see if you complete the form, it actually asks you, do you want deputies or not? In our business, because we're small, I just said no. So it's really easy. But remember, Solus practice is obligated to still have poppy compliance and, and all of that, even if you're small. No, perfect. Thanks for that, LCD. Here's another interesting one. Who is responsible for looking after my patient's information when they are admitted to hospital? Is it my responsibility to check that the books are not left open on a desk where the other patient walk past and the whiteboards on the ward doors don't have patients' names on them and the files have to have the names on the front? Oh, interesting one. Yeah. Yeah, and it is, um, I don't know how many of you remember the days with the red stickers on the files when HIV positive patients were actually identified with a red sticker on a file. And if people saw a red sticker, it was kind of a, a, a signal. So um, the hospital is a responsible party. Just remember the moment if you write notes in the hospital folders, um, the HPCSA wants you to have your own record. So don't rely on the hospital to be your source of patient records. But that duty to make sure that information is safe and is not um, accessible, you know, so the family of one patient visit, the other patient's lying there asleep, and then, you know, this other family is paging through information or seeing information. All of these things is part of the gap analysis that a hospital would need to do to see where are there risks that information can be accessed unauthorized. So um, the, the doctor, you're not the responsible party in that setting, but just bear in mind, if you participate in the record keeping or you're the one that leaves the file where it shouldn't be left, then people could say, but you are the one that caused the breach. So we're also seeing more and more hospitals trying to tighten the relationship between the practitioners and the hospital in terms of how do you deal with it? Because if the nurses who are employed by the hospital breach something, it could have a repercussion on another responsible party. So we'll, I anticipate the SLAs, the, the room rental agreements and so on in private hospitals are likely to change to also have poppy agreements in them or poppy clauses in them. Well, thanks so much, LCB. There's another question here. Is a PIA manual mandatory regardless of how large or small your practice is? So um, we'd need to see with the new, um, um, the, the new draft regulations that they've, that they've published. Um, but a couple of years back, they actually said everybody had to have it. So um, it, it, and then we scrambled. Um, so it is a nice thing to have because even if you're a small practice, because it does make it easy if you get queries for information. So anything from an attorney or, you know, the husband wants the child's information and they're in an ugly divorce and so on, that requester form gives you the opportunity to get some information. Why do they want the information? What's going on here? So I see it as a good risk management tool. So and it's, an, it's a fairly easy thing. It's not a difficult thing to do. So um, depending on what the, the regs turn out to be in the end, I would in any event recommend do it because 
it's 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 a it's a it gives something in writing if somebody is requesting information and it makes also the person think why do i want this information so yeah no very good point elsie here's another very interesting one um i'm worried about students collecting patients information for training purposes our junior students usually do field work at ngos and mpos we do not employ occupational therapists. These students must share patient information with us as lecturing staff. We do not have joint appointments with the hospital or these NGOs, MPOs. What do we do regarding information officer? Who is the IO, someone at the NGO, MPO, or each specific lecturer? Yeah. So you'll have, so the lecturer would fall under the varsity, okay, and the students as well. But the NGO and the MPO would have their own. They will also be a responsible party. So if it is um, under the National Health Act, if it's training that falls under the National Health Act, it does say that, that the students can access that patient. But that's in a classic setting, in a classic academic setting, the patient's in a hospital or in a, a mental health facility or wherever. The moment if an NGO comes in, you bring in a different dynamic. And I would suggest that there need to be an agreement similar to the operator agreements between the parties on this. So that every student is aware that the information of the patients in these NGO is confidential and must be treated as confidential. And the NGO has told patients that there are students that will be here for training purposes. So the purpose specification again, but as part of the training, they may look at your files, they may attend sessions, they may attend um, meetings of staff, whatever, so that the patients are absolutely aware and agree to that. Um, and if an individual doesn't want a third party to sit in on a one-on-one -on -one session, um, then we'd need to respect that. So NGOs and so on are like any other outside entity. In the academic institution falls under the National Health Act, and you've got the protection of the National Health Act for students and accessing patient records in that setting. Um, but the moment if they move out to non-entities not associated with that academic institution, it's more problematic and we actually need extra poppy protections. Are you going to take over, Doctor? I, I don't have any access to nothing following up on this question. Uh, uh, maybe if you could just um, perhaps just browse through the, the, the chat and see which questions you can. Good. <clears throat> All right, here's a good question on um, if you get a request from an insurance company after the patient has this is as passed on and they give you the initial consent that the person signed when they took out the insurance um, entity, that consent is enough. So, um, so that consent when somebody took out the insurance is adequate in terms of the Poppy Act. Um, so here's another interesting question that somebody says, if, um, if a patient posts something nasty about you on social media, is, does the Poppy Act protect you? Um, and your right to privacy and a good name and dignity always protects you if, if patients say defamatory things. Um, in our experience, social media is difficult to handle if patients say negative things about you. And 
um, you, you often don't get the desired effect if you threaten legal action and so on. So we've managed to shut down some of these negative comments by engaging with a person and also publicly, if somebody says something publicly um, and then say, but hang on, why didn't you address this with me? This is also why a complaints and compliments policy in a practice is so important because then you can always say, but hang on, you had all the opportunity to complain, but now you went to Facebook and that's where you complained instead of addressing it with us. We've got a policy that tells you how you can deal with us. So um, the social media and the funny thing is people think on social media, they can be more free than what they'll say to you face to face. But it's exactly the same set of legal rules that apply. And I think people must realize that. That's also why you have to be careful that you don't inadvertently violate confidentiality if you engage on social media. William, are you back? Yes, I'm back. So sorry about that. I, I don't know what happened there, but I'm back. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, would you recommend that we include all the information about the data subject's rights from the slide with the 10 points in it in the patient's information and consent form? Yeah. Yeah, you can. You can also put it up in the practice as a notice. Um, so that people are informed. I, I wouldn't do it in every treatment consent form, but you can put it in your T's and C's. Um, so there's various ways in which you can deal with it. Or you can just say, I disclose this when people have agreed to um, be part of our distribution list or be part of a bulk mail system or whatever. So, um, but it is a nice, I mean, we've distilled it um, from the law because it's a bit cumbersome, you know, and whereas notwithstanding the aforementioned type of drafting, we've made it in, in the 10 points. So people are welcome to use those 10 points, um, you know, in wherever you have to let people know what their rights are. Thanks so much. Here's one that, that's also quite pertinent. During the COVID pandemic, we are responsible to disclose results since infectiousness is an issue and contagious exposed individuals need to be revealed to employees so that they will be covered for isolation period and contracts will be screen protected. Please advise on this. Do we need written consent? Okay. So the notifiable medical conditions say you notify NICD and you notify if you are more than, I can't remember, it's in our Annex E plans, if you're more than 500 employees, you have to file certain reports to Department of Labor and so on. So there are statutory bodies to whom you report a COVID case and you're obligated. It's the same like measles and TB and so on. So you have to report that. There is no official duty to report to the employer. However, if the you want to employ, if you want to warn the employer, um, you need the patient's consent, that employee's consent. And it is really getting interesting now. I don't know if you saw there's a case before the labor court that was recently decided that said that the employer is entitled to fire a person who was he went for a COVID test didn't go into quarantine, went back to the work, didn't tell anybody, positive tests came back, still didn't tell anybody. And then when that came out, in particular because the person without a mask hugged a guy who's had a massive heart procedure. I don't, can't remember if it was a heart transplant or something, but somebody who's vulnerable and exposed that person to COVID. And the employer then fired that employee. So I think it's also important that we tell people what their responsibilities are. If you are tested and what you must do between that period. But if the employee says, I need this confirmation to my employer so that the medical scheme will pay, I can get paid sick leave, blah, blah, blah. Perfect. But make the patient sign that consent form so that nobody draws you into these. The last thing you want is to be drawn into these labor disputes. So that consent to disclosure is important in these cases because you don't have a statutory duty to disclose to the employer. 
Great. Thanks so much, LCB. I hope that answers it. Um, here's another interesting one. Does one have to keep separate forms for minor children in a family, or do we get them only when they turn 16, 18? Um, and, and the participant also just thanked you for, for another wonderful lecture, and I'm sure all of us feel the same. Thanks so much, Elsie. Uh, I'll say it again later, but uh, I just wanted to mention it now as well. You're very welcome. So remember the children cutoff date is date. Uh, year is 12. So a child 12 to 18 can independently seek health care, consent to health care, and have confidentiality of their health care. So what we did with the patient information forms our consents. It all has 0 to 12, 12 to 18 adults, and then incapacitated people. So um, you'd want to have those nuances because for example, nobody's saying the 14-year-old can't tell their parent. The 14-year-old must now just agree that it's okay that the parent is there. So it is important that we, that we have the necessary nuances in our patient information forms. And also that the 14-year-old who's now coming for contraceptives um, and she's on her dad's medical scheme understands how this thing works with the medical schemes. And that there's going to be an ICD-10 code and not all the schemes keep the information of the main member and the beneficiary separate. They actually, some of them disclose that. So the dad can just look up why Sissy was now at the doctor and what she got and so on. So um, it is, it's possible to, it, it is better to, to regulate that in your forms. And that's the thing, I know people hate forms, but it is in any business, it's something that makes you safer and it helps you regulate it. We've also, we've developed actually a children of the law information sheet, just because we get so many queries because now the parents is upset at the doctor because of the children's act. We say to them, excuse me, it's not the doctor that made the law, it's the parliamentarians that made the law. Some people also think the lawyers make the law, but the lawyers doesn't. It's the MPs, the parliamentarians that make the law. So to say to the parents, if you don't like this 12-year-old consent story, take it up with your political party, because that's where it must be sorted. It's not our fault, but you can... So there's useful things that one can use to kind of mitigate that risk. And then remember teenagers, that's why that consent to disclosure is also so important for them if they say, yes, my mom can be there, you know, and then the next consult, they're not so sure anymore whether it was a good idea that the mom was in the consult. So, um, you know, that's then your proof that you did agree. And if you want to withdraw the consent, because remember, that's now one of your rights is to withdraw your consent, then the teenager can withdraw the consent and say, mother is no longer here with you in the consult. So, yeah. No, thanks so much. It sounds like Sissy is going to have a tough year. And, yeah. and just on the point about lawyers not making the law, we, we just muddle it so that we can make profit out of them clarifying. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, here's another interesting one. Um, if you use Dropbox, for example, as an off-site storage and they are an international, not SA company, how do you secure an operator agreement? We had a similar question about Gmail as well, also being off-site and what's the poppy compliance there? All right. So what we did with Dropbox is, and, and if, if um, I can't remember all the details, but we actually put a query through to, to Dropbox in terms of what security measures and standards they have. Um, and then, and that apparently was in line with the best. So you, you, it's really hard or nearly impossible to hack into a Dropbox I know I know Dropbox business and Dropbox professional. So those two are really hard to log into and to hack into. Um, the biggest risk is our internal risk that somebody gives their password to somebody else or, and that's why we instituted the dual verification. So that even if somebody steals a password or use a password, the confirmation of the logon comes in on a cell phone. So it needs to be authorized there. So um, 
Dropbox, because we've had to investigate that, I'm fairly confident about Dropbox professional and Dropbox business. I don't know Dropbox usual. I don't know their things, but they're fairly um, responsive if you ask them. They send us all their certifications and stuff. Um, and that's why it was a bit higher grade for me. But Pat looked at it um, and she said, confirmed, and our multinational global client who made the request was very, very happy when we said to them, these are the standards that are applied. So um, Gmail, um, um, what is it called? G Drive, those Google Drive. Yeah, that, those I'm not so sure about. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, you, you'd need to, sometimes if you just do a general query to the support, to the provider because there is not a chance like my mom used to say there's not a snowball's chance in hell that you'll get google to sign or amazon to sign an operator agreement with you i don't think they will <laughs> so um but that's why you need to make sure that they are then in line with global good it standards um and you can ask that and you watch, I mean, in the news, because people must now disclose the breaches, watch, you know, it, you'll see whose data has been breached and so on. I mean, the, the, the recent WhatsApp breaches for me was, was very illustrative. So, um, so one need to, you need to also watch and see and, and make changes then if you think that certain ways of communication isn't, isn't secure. So we've moved totally our business internal communication is signal because that's in our assessment and after we've asked people who know the most secure system. Um, and, and you can't, you know, with Telegram, for example, every second person, their dog who's ever been on your contacts, you see when they join. And you can even see people who are not on your contacts if you search. So um, that's, for example, not so secure. So, you know, make these decisions on your business models. Um, just remember, if data is stored overseas, the Dropbox data is not stored here, it's stored overseas. You need to disclose that to people as well. So, um, yeah. No, so it certainly is a brave new world when it comes to these digital technologies. Um, here's a practitioner who might be a bit fearful of it, asking between hard copy patient files and electronic records, which option do you think is more manageable with regard to copy? And I suppose it depends on where you leave the patient files or your laptop, but please yeah. come in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that is, that's such an important thing because remember people think because it's electronic, it may be safer, but what if your computer is stolen or, or your phone is stolen? You know, some, some of it, I have a full copy of our Dropbox account on my phone. So one need to, to consider these things. And so um, paper-based, the, the big drawback with paper-based is the lack of backups. And that's the thing, if, if there's a fire or a flood, or, um, you know, a big break-in. The, the break-ins at practices where files are stolen is for me just, I can't comprehend. But, you know, if that happens, people often don't have a backup. The electronic stuff has got the benefit that you can have a backup system that is stored elsewhere. It can be in the cloud or on, you can make, um, we make um, external hard drive copies that stored not where the computer is. So it doesn't help it if you carry your external hard drive with your computer and both get stolen. So, um, so it's, it's, I like the electronic stuff also because it's searchable. Let's say the information regulator comes and they ask, did sissy now consent to mommy being in the consult? Okay, now you're looking for sissy's consent. Electronic, if you have an electronic system that is filed correctly, I must say, because if it's not filed named correctly, it's the searchability may become more difficult, but it does make it easier. So I've got a preference for non-paper stuff, but I do like paper. There's lots of bits of people paper all over always, half of which I 
throw away and the dark to it and all of that. But um, some people do like paper and the fact that you can do things on paper that you can't do electronically. So um, both are permissible. And remember, um, just electronic signatures and so on that you stick with the electronic communications and transactions at and the HPCSA rules. Don't store patient records in a Word document because anybody can change it. It needs to be permanent. If the record has been done, it needs to be permanent. And if you want to change, you need to have the fancy PDF so software where you can strike it through and initial next to your change, exactly like you would have done on a hard copy document. No, thanks for that, LCB. And I think that answers another question we had in the chat about electronic signatures. Um, so it's very important to, to keep that act in mind. And then also the, the HPCSA guidelines around it. Um, I think we had published something in the, the SOMA Insider just last month about it. So please go have a look at that. Um, here's another question. As an anesthetist, we have surgeons sharing ICD-10 codes to facilitate our billing. Is this still allowed? or does the surgeon now have to get consent to share the information with us? No, this is one of those exceptions in the National Health Act that says you can share information between practitioners if it is necessary and in the patient's interest. And of course, it's in the patient interest that we share the ICD-10 code so that we can both bill and that there's also no discrepancies because the discrepancies trigger forensic investigations by medical schemes. So um, that falls under that exception. We also use that exception where anybody in the healthcare provider team suddenly say, but I'm not helping, I'm not giving you this patient's records. Um, you know, you can't see it. Or they say you must pay access requester fees under the buyer or something like that. So um, it is an important thing and it's supposed to make continuity of care and care coordination possible. And I think that's in the patient's interest. If you go and, and now disclose the ICD-10 codes to your colleagues who are not treating that patient, that's a different matter. Then it is a contravention. Um, and you'd need the patient's consent if you want to, for example, uh, do that patient case in a journal club and then you use these ICD-10 codes. You'd need the patient consent for that. But if it's part of that therapeutic relationship and you both treat this patient, that provision of the National Health Act covers you. Perfect. And, and somewhat related is another question. How do we send our accounts to medical aids in a poppy compliant manner? I think that's also a question many of our practitioners might have. So your account must comply with Reg 5 and Reg 5 compels certain personal information to be disclosed. So under the Poppy Act, if a law requires a disclosure, you have to disclose but you need to tell the patient about it. And this is where we say to people, if you don't want the ICD-10 code to be disclosed, we can't submit the account to the scheme. You need to pay cash. You know, you need to inform people of in that, that openness condition of, of the, the Poppy Act. You need to say to people, this is what's going to happen. And if you don't want an ICD-10 code on your account, I can't submit it to the medical scheme and we must make a different payment arrangement. So um, it is important that people um, know what the Medical Schemes Act say on that. If it's not a medical scheme patient, then you just need to comply with normal invoicing criteria on what should be on an invoice and what makes an invoice valid and so on. So then it's just kind of um, the, the VAT legislation and the um, tax and finance legislation that will say how that should look. Um, and then obviously, um, so you don't have to um, have it in any particular format. Um, um, I know GPs that still do invoicing by hand. They write it out like, you know, with a little carbon paper thingy. So um, that's, that's all okay. Um, and, and some of them, if the patient then, if the patient says, I will submit to their medical scheme, that thing must comply with Reg 5. However, if the patient's not submitting to the medical scheme or it's a total private patient, yeah, you don't need to comply with Reg, Reg 5. You just need to comply with like the Consumer Protection Act to say what service was rendered, blah, 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 and then all the tax legislation. Oh, great. Thanks for that, Elsie. Here's another interesting one. As part of collecting new patient information, my practice asks for an emergency contact. 
Do patients need to get permission to disclose these details as they are disclosing someone else's personal information? <laughs> or do we need to make it clear why we need this information? So what we normally put a little um, uh, small print below that and say, by sharing this person's detail, you confirm that you've discussed this with this person. Because it's as bad when you use that that emergency number and the person says, I don't want anything to do with this person. Don't call me doctor. So um, it then it's then um, a guarantee that the patient gives you that they've got the person's permission. And, and just remember there's two types of contacts that you want. There's a debt collecting contact and there's a treatment and a consent contact. So, um, you know, somebody will say, mm, I don't want my husband to be my emergency contact. I don't trust him. If I'm there unconscious, mm, I'm not so sure. You know, he'll say switch off the machines. So I want my sister. But if it gets to the finance stuff, go all out. You can contact my husband. <laughs> so um, just this is why that purpose specification is so important, because the person's choice, normally those forms just says next of kin or contact details of a person not residing with you. It doesn't say why we want that information. So that purpose specification is absent. So think about why you want it and um, then give people the option to, to have two different people if they, if they want to. It will also make your lives easier. No, well, with that in mind, I'll, be, I'll definitely have to change my emergency contact. I think my, my wife thinks I played too much golf last weekend. So just to be <laughs> safe, I think I should certainly change that. Um, <laughs> does this mean the end of unsolicited phone calls from call centers? Um, <laughs> are you going to break it to him or should I? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, and this is, the, the, this is exactly the two complaints that was laid in this household on that. Um, so, and in particular, the one is a really, really big insurance company. Um, and they were on the red carpet as to where they got this person's details, because they refused to tell us where they got the household members' details from. So, um, I'm not saying it won't happen, um, but you've now got the only people that's supposed to contact you unsolicited would be people where you've bought services or goods from. Okay, so the bank can continue to contact you, but you've got a right to then say at a stage, I'm opting out. You can't opt out of getting your bank statements, <laughs> but you can opt out of the marketing communications and so on. So, um, it, 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 it works like a bomb to, I think these lists are being shared and if you get flagged in a way that you give people a lot of grief, then suddenly it stops. So um, I normally say to people, please make sure I'm removed from your list. So, um, and what people often say, they say, yeah, but you bought something at um, the Randberg Mall. And I'm saying, I haven't been in the Randburg Mall in 15 years, you know, <laughs> it's impossible. And that you gave your details when you were there. So people are aware at what the law says. So they try to establish a commercial relationship where you, by saying you bought something from them and so on. So they know the excuse. Um, so, but you can then ask, but mm, I don't, I haven't bought anything and please remove me from your list because the second time that they call you, you can go all out. So um, you may see an increase now in the month of June before the Poppy Act comes into full force and effect. So, and, and the most annoying ones are the, these electronic calls because you can't then <laughs> say to the person, where did you get my details? So, and I think that's something that the information regulator may very well make regulations on in future to say that people, you cannot do that without there being an option to opt out. I mean, one of the most spectacular non opt out, yes, you can opt out, but it never works, is, is Vodacom business. You can type stop every single time you never get removed from that list so um those are the types of things that the information regulator would take up and i think would 
a lot of us will appreciate that because it, it gets unbearable sometimes. And I think doctors in particular are soft targets. People think you've got heaps of money and they're targeting you with marketing all the time. So um, I, I empathize with you, but you've got good rights now under the, the Poppy Act. Yeah, I've shouted at many robot voices over the phone already. Um, um, I find it doesn't really work, but hopefully Poppy <laughs> will now give me some redress. Uh, here's an interesting one. We've had a, a few related to this. Um, the time period for which records are kept would I imagine be a matter of personal circumstances. If I find it useful to keep psychotherapy patient records for 10 years, because patients often return only many years after their previous consult, would I be entitled to do so in terms of the Poppy Act? Yes. So as long as you can justify that. So if anybody says to you about the HPCSA says six years and then, you know, you can give yourself a bit of leeway. Um, but if, if that's your experience, that the psychotherapy records are important and it's really important to have that history, you can keep it longer. You must just say that it's necessary for me to keep it longer. So you can write the stuff up in your poppy policy, for example, to say in this practice, we keep certain records for so long because of the importance of having that patient's history. And here's a familiar face, it's Prof Naidu. Um, on our board and the chair of our EST committee, is the DOH able to geotag a patient with COVID-19 so that we can identify hotspot areas and implement local lockdown measures? They should actually be able to. Um, and, and that's, but the, the, the COVID app should have allowed that as well as the, um, the notifiable medical condition system, but I'm not sure it works so well. And I know with the app in particular, people have been extremely worried about the, the personal information and um, because you, you still have, you don't have phones being anonymized. The phone is identifiable by a tower in which vicinity it is. So um, yeah, it is, it's possible, it would be good and it would be, in my view, a although it's compiled of personal information, there would be a public interest override. So our constitution does provide for a balancing of rights where there could be competing rights. And I think this is one of those examples where there are competing rights and where we may say, we're doing that to protect the lives of other people. We're doing that to protect the dignity of other people. So, and we do it in the least possible intrusive measure. So we don't say, Elsabi and William um, and Dr. Mazuka and this one and that one and that one was there. But you'll say there is a hotspot of these six people, for example, that, yeah. So I think it's possible to do with, even with the data that we currently have, it should be possible because the forms that you complete actually gives that and, and you'll have, yeah. I, but I'm not sure the information yeah. is, yeah. Yeah, and I recall, didn't they appoint Judge O'Regan to, to yes. oversee yeah. some of that tracing as yeah. well? Yes. So I, I'm not too sure what had come of it, but I know that at the start of the pandemic, there was this, this yes. real initiative to try and get it in place and also then protect people's privacy. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, Judge Kate O'Regan is, is brilliant. She served on the Constitutional Court for a long time. She worked at Bowman Gilfill and so... I mean, she's, she's absolutely beyond reproach, but I'm not sure what happened with that initiative. If there's one thing that must come back, I don't want the rotisserie chicken saga back, but if there's one thing that I think we can have back is, um, is, is that. In particular, as it looks as if we, you know, you guys see how long my hair is. I've taken um, an oath that an oath that I will cut my hair if I get my vaccine. So we'll see um, when we get the vaccines. So um, it, so it may be important to, I mean, the, we're just on this, people are saying it's the third wave, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Um, and it seems as if we're keeping it at bay. 
but you know we may need those types of measures and with with new variants and so on i mean we don't know how this pandemic's going to to play out in the end so yeah it well let's be... hope you don't become alcibi rapunzel clink um, <laughs> yeah. and just for for everybody attending my hair looks like this just because it looks terrible I, i've got no no justification for it uh, <laughs> let's take two more questions and then i think we'll we'll hand over Dr. Mzukwa to close. Um, just to reiterate, um, we'll be sending out all of this information, the poppy pack link there to the link to the recording, the slides, we'll be sending all of that to the attendees who might have had internet troubles or whatever the case may be. And the questions we, we didn't get to, there are quite a number of them. We'll try and compile some of them into a FAQ and, and some of the more specific questions um, you can either reach out to myself at Salma Legal. We'll try and assist you. If it's something that requires more attention, we can refer you to Elsebi. And we'll also try and just reach out to you and, and answer some of the questions that we don't get to in the chat tonight. Um, let's see. During telehealth, um, being allowed during the pandemic, emails are often used to send referrals, certain scripts, and to, oh, sorry, I don't know what that is, to receive patient results. What do you do if your email is breached? Do you just report to the information regulator? Do you suggest deleting every mail after you download results to a secured device? That's an interesting one. Yeah, so um, so I don't think once, e you need to make sure your email server is has got strict settings on. So I know ours are so strict that if there is an attempt to attack, it bombs out the whole system. It, irks me no end, but we all live with it because it is a security feature. So, you know, it's annoying, but it's okay. So um, one, can, one can address it at a server level, but if the information comes onto a computer and it goes onto the receptionist computer, for example, um, we propose that you have an email auto message and a footer in your email that, for example, says this email address is accessed by non-healthcare professionals, for example. Um, or, you know, so you set the conditions around that. Um, the, the emails, things that hang around on email accounts, so an attachment to an email, um, our policy in our business, because we also deal with a lot of confidential things, is that message get PDF'd and filed in our secure Dropbox account um, so that we don't lose any information because there's some server override or something, but also it then is removed from the system. So if the email system is hacked, that document is somewhere else available and it is safe. Um, you can also ask your colleagues to, um, to PDF with a password, for example. Um, so the report, so even though the receptionist may see the email, um, she can't open the particular attachment. Um, and the Dropbox professional software and so on and, and putting a password on it, it's not rocket science. If I can do it, anybody can do it. So um, that, that is a good way. Um, the other option is to, we've recently discovered software that actually um, saves our emails. So the older emails get removed from the server and saved in Dropbox automatically at, a cert at certain intervals. So it's still accessible if you need it, but it then takes it out of that server thing. Um, so it, it does make it, um, make it a bit better. And, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's also not expensive to have your own server. I know many practitioners still have a drx at gmail.com and they use a Gmail server, but having your own server that it's not it's not unachievable and it does provide a bit more security in in my view because you're allowed to have these settings we've got very strong spam and phishing settings and so on and we we actually get a report and then we blacklist or we whitelist because sometimes accidentally somebody gets gets flagged as a risk and they're actually not and i can then whitelist that email address so it's not 
I think it's worth one's while to, to do it that way. No, thanks so much, Chelsea. I, I see it's just turned quarter past nine. Um, I think what, what tonight has showed us is there are many questions around the Poppy Act and getting compliant. Um, hopefully this is the first step or, or not the first step. Hopefully you've taken some steps, but if this is the first step to become Poppy compliant, you would have taken a very good one. And, and we hope with the assistance that we've got from LCB, the poppy pack that we've managed to negotiate for our members and the assistance you'll get from Salma that you'll be well on your way to becoming compliant. And if there are any questions you require, any questions you have or anything else you require, more than welcome to reach out to Salma and we're always there to support our, our members and, and practitioners. Um, LCB from, from our side, thank you so much for, for the presentation and for all the wonderful work that you do in the healthcare sector. I think many of the people on here tonight know the work that you do and know of you. So it's, it's wonderful to, to have you back in the SOMA fold and to, to help our practitioners. Um, and, and then just the, the management team that, that made all of this possible. Thanks so much for all the work that was done in the background. Um, it's, it's certainly a team effort. And then to all the attendees, um, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. I think we'll, we'll certainly have a follow-up or, or something planned um, as, as this journey continues. And I look forward to, to hearing from many of you and helping you with many of your, your problems. Um, let me hand it over to Dr. Mazuka to do the close. Just a reminder that we will be sending out all the information, the how you get your poppy pack, where you can acquire it from, the, the fact that it's free for our members, we'll be sending out the recording, a link there too, as well as the slides to this presentation. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, over to you, Dr. Mzukwa. Uh, thank you so much, uh, William, um, Dr. Obezen, and uh, Ms. King uh, for those inputs. I think we can all agree that tonight's session really has been particularly very useful and uh, will no doubt provide some important uh, markers for us you know, as we move closer to the first of July. And really thank you, uh, Ms. King, uh, for your wonderful insights in, in, in this regard. And um, with that, I think I'll, I now formally close the session. Thank you for um, all the, uh, the, the attendees. Uh, and uh, please conduct us if you have any Queries like, like uh, William said, if there are any queries regarding coffee, or if you like more information uh, on summer membership, please also follow us on all the social media platforms uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and Telegram. Let us know what you, you, you thought about this, uh, this event this evening. Um, take care and be safe till we meet again on the 29th of June. Uh, for the webinar on criminalization of doctors. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.